zitten. Het gaat allemaal van jullie eigen lunchtijd af. En het was al zo'n korte koffie, hè? Goed. Dat was de in Dutch. Um, there are ten speakers today, on Friday. Nine of them are men. One is a woman. By tomorrow, there are two more women. That's 100% rice. But still, three out of about 20 women speakers. What does that say? Or am I just, what do you say? Pardon? It says a lot. It says a lot about what? About society? About this society? Or what? I saw it and I thought, well, I make that remark. Which brings me to Professor Jenny Slotman. Jenny is a female name. Um, she is here. She comes from Maastricht. She was trained to be a philosopher and she worked in the 90s as a physiotherapist. Um, she wrote a book two years ago, which is called Our Strange Body, goes for us all. And for what I read, she more or less tells us you have a body, but also you are a body. That I don't understand, but she has 30 minutes to prove that. Okay. <laughs> uh, yes, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you very much um, for the invitation. I'm really happy to be here. It's uh, for me a bit of an unusual um, audience. Um, uh, well, as you know, I'm a philosopher, but I have a little bit of a clinical experience, but that's a long time ago. So, um, first of all, I have to, uh, well, as you already can see, I changed my title a little bit. So it's a little bit different than in the program. And also, I changed a little bit my talk, but maybe I should not uh, linger on that too much because probably you didn't read the abstract, so it's okay. <laughs> right, so um, it's going to be a little bit philosophical. I hope that's fine for you. I guess you can take that because you just had coffee. Um, anyway, so here we go. What I'm going to do, the outline of my uh, talk, I just want to start with um, indicating what is the problem of medically unexplained physical symptoms, MUPS or MUS. Then um, I will talk about, um, or what I actually want to do is, I want to uh, bring forward uh, the claim that part, or maybe most, the, 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 gra the greatest part of the problem of MUS or MUPS is a philosophical problem. And it has to do with the body-mind dualism. Um, then I will say something about um, what I call strategies in healthcare to deal with this, the limits of body-mind dualism. And I call them psychologization and neuroreductionism. And I will explain that later what it means. And then I will, since this is an international conference, I thought it might also be nice to use some German words. Um, <laughs> Leib and Körper. Um, I d I there are no English words. Actually, the funny thing is that these, these words are used by a German philosopher. And of course, his work is translated into English. And the English translator chose to um, write Körper with, with body with a small b and Leib, the body with a capital. But anyway, so it makes no sense in English. Anyway, but um, I use this distinction to explain that we can think about our body in a different way and that um, human beings are not just a body and a mind, but that we, that we are embodied beings. 
Okay, and finally, I will say some things about this, say, embodiment approach related to uh, the problem of maps. Okay, so what's the problem? Well, the problem for people suffering from maps or maps is, of course, an individual problem. A lot of people suffer from problems, and the problem is that they don't get in uh, adequate healthcare. Most of the time they go from one doctor to another doctor and no one knows what is wrong. So there, there's a lot of suffering on the individual level. Well, as you all as professionals, you know these individual stories. But of course, the problem is not only individual, it is also a societal and even a political problem. And I think this is, this is uh, really clear in recent debates going on about chronic fatigue. It has to do about people suffering from these kind of problems. They don't feel uh, that they get recognition for the disease. And this is a politi political issue because if you think of the, of the disease cancer, it's highly recognized as a, even as a state enemy. Huh? Richard Nixon declared a war on cancer, providing a lot of money to cure cancer. But for these kind of problems, they are not recognized as real diseases and therefore um, uh, not much money is provided for finding solutions. So it's an individual problem, but also a societal and political problem. Now, what's, pro what's the cause of the problem? Well, of course, we can say we talk about medically unexplained symptoms. So the problem is that we don't know how to explain it. Well, then there is a lot of, uh, yeah, you can think of, well, now we don't know how to explain it, but maybe in the future, if we have better scans, if we have better blood tests, then we will can, will be able to explain it. Well, maybe that's so, but I think that the deepest problem of mass and maps is not rooted in, say, mysteries in biology or physiology, which still have to be solved, Rather, the problem is caused by a certain way of categorizing and conceptualizing. So in fact, what I'm saying here, this problem is caused by philosophers. And well, you all may know that philosophers like problems. Eh? They don't like searching solutions, but they like to linger on problems. That's true, but most of the time, Philosophical problems do not really affect our reality. Huh? If you really have this philosophical problem of what, let's say, the, the question, um, what makes a human human, or what makes a human a good human being? Well, you can think of about this, and of course you will not find an answer, so it's a problem. But you can live nice and quietly without having that answer. However, the um, Problem of the, the 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 problem of maps is directly caused by philosophy. It is caused by um, well, I would not say that this is a, the, the the only person guilty. Um, this is Descartes, a 17th century uh, philosopher, and actually before his time there was no problem of body mind. Body mind were just together. Uh, so there was not something like, oh, we have a physical problem, um, but the cause is not physical. That's what the problem of MUPS is, isn't it? Before Descartes, that was not the case. What happened in Descartes, he says, Descartes was, um, this, is, this, this is the only real philosophical bit, so I just go through it a little bit quickly. Actually, Descartes was saying, um, he was searching for absolute truth. And then he started philosophizing. So what is something I cannot doubt about? So he did this thought experiment. That's what philosophers do. Right? They do experiments while thinking. And then he said, well, you know, I can doubt everything in life. I can even doubt that I'm standing here. Maybe I'm dreaming. <laughs> the only thing I cannot doubt is that I'm doubting. And that means I am thinking. So the only thing that is undoubtable is I think. 
So he says, this leads to the conclusion that we have this thing called thinking, it's undoubtable, and the rest is all physical stuff, and we can doubt about it. And that actually leads to body-mind dualism. So the body then became this physical thing. It is extended in space, or takes space, we all take space. And according to Descartes and 7th century uh, um, philosophers, it was seen as a machine, comparable to a machine. Well, the interesting thing, the, the thinking part, what is called res extensa in Latin, uh, the thinking thing, we now call it the psyche or the mind, or maybe some people call it the soul. Well, what is it actually? Well, it is the, the only part that you cannot doubt, but you cannot point at it. It is not extended. It is not physical. So actually, it's rather mysterious. And therefore, another philosopher later in the 20th century says, well, actually, we're talking about a ghost in the machine. Uh, the ghost in the machine. So everything is clear about the body. And this is also um, actually the success of, say, this body-mind dualism, because you have to imagine that before that time, you know, body, mind, soul, everything was together. So it was a bit of fuzzy bit, like medicine was a really fuzzy bit. But with this new um, body-mind dualism, and this also comes in the same time as modern anatomy, so the body was opened up. So everything of the body became analyzable. And of course, it also leads in our time, but you can analyze and you can pick out the little parts, analyze even further by scans, etc. You can also repair it. But the problem, of course, is, and this is also what I, I, I teach as a philosopher to medical students, that the body is very clear. This is this thing, this machine, with all these parts, and you all studied it. I also did anatomy, physiology, etc. But then what is the psyche? What is the mind? Often I ask the medical students, so, okay, what, uh, what, is, what, is, what do you mean with if, it's, if it, it's not somatic, it's psychological? Yeah, it's just psychological. It's not somatic. I don't know, it's psychological. So it's a bit mysterious. It's the ghost in the machine. And that's a real problem. Actually, so what happens is that the body became something very clear and defined, and the mind or the psyche something mysterious, or even, you could say, a residual category. Eh? Something that, if it's not somatic, it must be psychological. Okay, well, dualism can be fine if you break your leg, Someone repairs it, it's all fine. <coughs> Nothing wrong with that. But the problem is, of course, when a problem manifests itself physically, hmm, somatically, but there is no somatic cause. And this, of course, is the case in MUS or MUPS. Yeah, at the example of, you know, fatigue, and if there are no somatic signs as infection or anemia. Okay, um, well, health professionals, they actually, they are uh, faced by these kind of problems every day. I think you all, are, uh, that you see people with physical problems, but that you cannot really relate all those physical problems to the clear somatic cause. But there are ways to deal with this. And I call this crafty strategies to deal with the limits of dualism. Actually, it means this, this strategy involves that you, you allow yourself to jump from, from, say, the somatic side to the mental side, even though in the Cartesian dualism, actually it's impossible because the mind is everything that the body is not. So actually it's impossible that the two interact. But we do it all the day. So the first strategy, and uh, I call it psycho psychologization, it means 
that you provide a mental or a psychological explanation for physical problems. Uh, for instance, someone chronic fatigue, you say, well, there are no somatic signs. So you probably have negative thoughts about your health, which causes your problems. Well, I think this is um, done very often. And the problem, of course, is for a lot of people, uh, this feels like a stigmatization. Uh, um, also, as it, it, it might help in some cases, huh? so psychologization might help, but also in other cases, it might lead to stigmatization. Another um, strategy is the other way around. If you have like mental problems, that they are explained in terms of problems in the central nervous system of even better in the brain. As you all know, we, leave, we live in an area in which, according to a lot of people, the brain dictates everything. Right. Um, Sometimes these things work, huh, these strategies. Sometimes they do not. But in both cases, they imply what I call a very poor, limited idea of what body actually means. Psychologization, psychologization implies that the body is actually just a passive thing that obeys, obeys the mind. Huh? If, you, if you believe in psychologization, it is about, well, you have certain thoughts, and these thoughts direct and rule your body, which implies that your body does what your mind or psyche, whatever it means, does. Well, a rather poor idea of the body, I would say. Um, well, in neuroreductionism, it's even worse. Um, the only thing, <laughs> according to the brain hype uh, people, is that we are our brains. How funny is that? Um, philosophers often talk about then the idea of being a brain in a fat. Well, as you all know, uh, even I remember my neurology classes, this is just stupid. Uh, because the brain is just a very important link in the whole integrative part of the, together with the peripheral nervous system, with your senses, etc. So in all this brain talk, there is no attention paid to, say, a specific body in which that brain is lodged. So these two strategies go together with a rather poor idea of the body. Well, and of course, since I think uh, the philosophers are guilty here, huh? and having produced this very limited idea of the body, they should also provide an alternative. Well, the alternative um, can be found in 20th century uh, philosophy stream that is called phenomenology. Um, I won't, well, it's um, by the German philosopher Husserl. And he says, well, actually, if you look at the body, it is true. We can look at our bodies as if, as if huh, it is an object, huh, as if it is like this <coughs> extended thing, as Descartes says. In that sense, uh, if you look at yourself or if you look at other people, your body is a thing. Uh, you can measure things about it. You can um, perceive certain physical features. Um, but it's very much the way you look at your own body from a perspective from abroad, say a, a third person uh, perspective. And this is also um, goes together with, if I look at my body, if um, I inspect my body before the mirror, there is a certain distance between, say, my perception and my body. And this is also what can be called, I have my body. So that's one experience of the body. 
but there is another experience of the body. And this is, um, so this is called uh, in German the Körper experience, but this is called the Leib experience and which has more to do with the lift experience of your own body from a first person perspective. And it's, it's especially, prof this experience is provided by um, the, the perception of the proprioception, touch, and what is also called all kind of hair, localized sensations. If I touch myself, uh, I feel myself here and now. My proprioception, I feel how I'm standing here. So it's an experience of my own body um, of being here and now. And that is the experience, I, there is no distance. Huh? I am here, I feel it. Huh? So this is what is called, um, what I call that you are your body. So <laughs> I hope, Mart, that you already uh, get it. <laughs> what I mean with being your body, it's not, it's, it's that you, yeah, there is not, nothing outside your body. And of course, I didn't uh, mention also the experience of pain huh, can really confirm this is me. Hmm? There is nothing outside that. Okay, and you could say that this very idea of life brings me to um, what philosophers also call the, the phenomenon of embodiment. So the body is not only this object, huh? but the body is a subject. It is an embodied subject. And it actually means that, you know, if we think of ourselves as humans, it actually is rather odd to think of yourself of there is something like a mind in here probably, which directs me that I'm going to walk like this. But this is not what we're doing. Huh? We just, I walk around here because there is a space around me that invites me to um, walk this way. So embodiment says that there is no subjectivity, no agency, no rationality without being embodied. So the body provides me with um, a zero point of action and orientation. And I said, I only have two minutes left. Yeah, oh, okay. I leave this one. Um, well, this might, uh, just one, uh, this means, I think this is a nice, I have to go very quick now. What's happening here in this embodiment theory is that whereas normally philosophers think uh, that, that it's, it, it's seen that human beings are first and almost a mind and I think uh, that th that is our zero point, the embodiment theorists say no, zero point is not I think but I can. And um, this actually means that we do a lot of things without thinking about them. Huh? If I grasp something, I do not think about it. I might only think about it if I have to learn grasping. Hmm? But normally, my environment invites me to do things. Um, and I call this actually something like being in a balance or equilibrium with your environment, and that's also what I can mean. And actually, when I was listening to the previous speaker, I thought, yeah, maybe we can also name it like a dynamic system. Human existence is a dynamic system that is constantly uh, reacting on invitations from the environment. Okay, um, maybe I just, uh, I have to skip this because I don't want to. Um. Well, the thing is then, what can we do with this embodiment uh, approach in clinical practice? Well, first of all, do not only concentrate on those somatic features, but explore patients' experiences of their body, of their being in a certain balance or unbalance in their world. And this might, of course, sound like a knockdown argument <coughs> that you have to listen to your patient stories. Well, of course you have to listen, you would say, but I've been teaching um, 
interview skills to first year medical students and we read all those uh, researches and it's really amazing that if doctors ask a patient, so can you tell me what your problem is? After about 15 seconds, so that's the uh, average, a doctor will interrupt a patient. 15 seconds, that's what you get. So ask questions and listen to patients. Um, and then finally, um, I haven't talked much uh, of, I haven't talked at all about osteopathy, but, um, but I'm here actually to, to, uh, uh, to learn, but also because right at this moment I'm uh, preparing a new uh, research project. And um, well, from my philosophical theory, you can grasp that in a way it makes no sense or it's not productive to really um, make a separation between, say, somatic therapies and psychological therapies. But that um, any treatment can, say, uh, intervene in a person's embodied existence. Any treatment can invite a person to um, do, uh, I say that, acquire different habits or to restore his or her equilibrium. And in, so in my, uh, and this is actually the, so the, what I was thinking of when I coming here, so I, I thought I would come here, I would do some networking because um, my, in my future research I'm now setting up is that what I want to do in my research is to uh, do qualitative research on, uh, so have interviews with professionals and patients and see how these dimensions of embodiment, uh, how they actually are done in various practices. And one of the practices I would like to research is osteopathy. So if uh, one of you <laughs> wants to collaborate with me in the future, I would be really happy. Okay, so this, is, uh, this was my talk. I'm sorry that I had to go a little bit quick. So thank you very much for your attention. Mm -hmm.